have you ever had a passage or had a, a scripture that you just couldn't quite seem to get over? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of them. Amen. Um, wh- one of those for me here recently has been Psalm 19. I've, I've already shared a few times this year out of Psalm 19. It's, it's just been, I don't know, I keep coming back to it. Uh, and so here, here once again, I, I want to start our message today in, in Psalm 19. I want to read to you the first uh, six verses or so. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Here's what David says. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Think about that. The daytime pours out speech, nighttime reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Think about this for just a minute. In some translations, in, instead, of, instead of night sky, it, it actually says stars. Their voice goes throughout the earth. There is not a single language of the earth that the voice of the stars are not being heard. And what are they saying? They're glorifying God. They're proclaiming His goodness. They're proclaiming His handiwork. You, you, think, you think we did a good job this morning singing about the goodness of God? We did a pretty good job. But the stars are out doing us every night, <laughs> declaring the glory of God. And he says, there's not a single language of the earth they're not being heard. Paul wrote in in Romans chapter 1, he says, because of creation, because of the the testimony of creation and nature declaring the existence of creator, there's no creation without a creator, amen? He says, therefore, men are without excuse before God. I've heard stories about... um, missionaries to Africa who who are the first Western people to go to a a region that was largely untouched years ago. I I imagine, you know, our our maps are pretty detailed now, but (laughs) coming across a tribe of, of people who had never met a Christian in their life, and yet they were making sacrifices out of their flocks for atonement for their sin basically living under the Old Testament, sacrificing because they had guilt in their heart because of, not because of anyone's preaching, but the testimony of creation. And and they said to these missionaries when they came to them, what took you so long getting here (laughs) to tell us about Jesus who came and and died and and was the sacrifice once and for all? Paul says we're we're without excuse. Let's keep reading here in, in Psalm 19. It kind of changes gears here at the end of verse 4. He says, In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. You'll have a fresh revelation on, on that last part later this year. <laughs> Nothing's hidden from the heat of the sun. You, you may not feel it right now, but, but there will be a day at this July or August that you'll say, I wish it was 30 degrees in January again. <laughs> There's nothing hidden from the heat of the sun. This is not written in a negative context. There's nothing hidden from its heat. The sun is, in the natural world, our ultimate power source. I'm not talking about solar panels on, on your house, but imagine what life could exist without daily sunshine. It'd be impossible. Nothing is hidden from the rays of the sun, from the, the light and from the heat of the sun. And look at what 
the Son is compared to. He said every day coming out, the new dawn, it's like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And English Standard Version says, like a strong man runs its course. Many translations say, like a champion running his course with joy. Only Jesus, amen? Jesus is not to be compared to the Son. The Son is to be compared to Jesus. Yes. The lesser is a reflection of the greater, amen? There's a, there's a day coming where we won't need the Son anymore because the light of Jesus will light up the entire city of New Jerusalem. John said in, in uh, Revelation yeah. chapter 1, he said when he saw Jesus, one of the descriptions he gave was his face was shining like the sun in the fullness of its strength. The light and the glory and the radiance of our champion Jesus. The sun comes up like a bridegroom coming out of its tent and like a champion. Jesus has conquered all and has overcome all. He's our champion. Amen? <laughs> this verse parallels so well with Malachi chapter 4 when Malachi is, is prophesying about the day of the Lord and he, he says but for those who fear him the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings S-U-N the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings there's, there's this, this mysterious image, and I'm, I have just been fixed on it and stuck on it for four weeks this year, <laughs> of Jesus rising in beauty and in brightness, and we will see him in the eastern sky. Amen? And Malachi says that he's going to have healing in his wings. Healing. This is a, a verse on the day of the Lord when he rises with healing in his wings. It has always been God's interest for our healing. In New Jerusalem, the tree of life, what are its leaves going to be used for? The healing of the nations. Healing for the world. Think of, think of all the hurt and all the pain and all the suffering, the tree of life is going to be used for the healing of the nations. He took stripes on his back for healing. He, he declared to the people uh, wandering in, in the desert, I am the God who heals you. Psalm declares he sent forth his word to heal them. Amen? It is, in, it is one of the interests in God's mind to heal. I know this verse is, is talking about the day of the Lord, but I want to talk about God's will for healing yesterday, today, and tomorrow, not just tomorrow. How many times uh, have you read the Bible? And, and I, I've realized I've, I've done this as well. I'll read something, and wow, that sounds amazing. That sounds incredible. That must be for the new age. Has anyone else done that before? Or you read something and you say, wow, that sounds terrible. <laughs> wow, I don't want to be responsible for that. That must be for the Old Covenant. <laughs> Oftentimes, we don't want to take responsibility as humans. Amen? It's human nature to not take responsibility for something. Remember that. I'm, I'm going to repeat that a, a few times today. But let's, let's talk about healing for, for just a, a few minutes here today. When I got my first uh, suit, fitted for my first suit as a, as a young whippersnapper, it had three buttons, right? And, and my dad was showing me. He says, okay, remember the buttons. When you stand up, button your jacket. And here's the, the rule on buttoning your buttons. The top one is always the middle one is sometimes and the third button if your suit has a third button is never <laughs> always sometimes never. 
Am I, any, I, I, you, you think I don't own a suit right now <laughs> because I don't wear them, but I do, I do own a few suits. Uh, <laughs> but the rule is always, sometimes, never. I want to use this uh, as an illustration today for how Christians view God's will to heal and, God's, uh, and, and how, how we view when God heals or who God heals. There are three opinions on it. Very good. <laughs> Many Christians believe today that God no longer heals. Read through the, the New Testament, read through the book of Acts, read through the ministry of Jesus, and that move of the Holy Spirit that you see in the book of Acts, the ministry of Jesus that you see in the Gospels, that was for the establishment of the church. This is called secessionalism as in ceasing, uh, the, the move of the Holy Spirit, not, not just ceasing of healing, but the ceasing of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the ceasing of, of speaking in tongues. This is a, a major theology in, in the West uh, and in different parts of the world. The mentality behind it is that the church needed that move of the Holy Spirit to become established in the world. And now that we have organization, now that we have education, now that we have um, man's uh, ability to, to take it and run with it, we no longer need the move of the Holy Spirit. I have never heard something more arrogant <laughs> preached from a pulpit. We need the move of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. In, in the Old Testament, they needed it just as bad. This is why God said to the prophet, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit. Amen? We need the Holy Spirit. So that's the, the never theology. The sometimes theology says, I have seen and heard testimony of God healing people before, so I, I can't say that he never does it. I've also seen people not healed before, so can I say it's God's will to always heal? And when you hear someone say, I believe it's God's will to heal, the first thing that comes into your mind is, I know someone who wasn't. I have a, a dear grandmother or a dear aunt or a, a dear friend, dear saint of God that was full of faith and, and a strong Christian and died sick, and, and you're telling me that it's God's will to heal everyone? So many people, sometimes. I want to take you through a few scriptures today and tell you I believe that it is always God's will for you to be healed. Amen? I want to, to go through a few scriptures and, and show you this, and I also want to say you should never let experience dictate your doctrine. You should never let what you see in life change what you know God's Word says. Amen? Why are some people not always healed? I want to possibly answer this as well. That's, I only have so much time here today, so let me get going here. These, these are very big questions. And I've got your attention. You're very quiet. I like it. <laughs> Uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark chapter 1. It has been a question for ages, thousands of years. Is it God's will to heal? You and I are not the first ones to ask this question. Mark chapter 1, only a few verses uh, starting in verse 40 here. Is everyone there? Good deal. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, he being Jesus, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Let's talk about leprosy for a moment. 
Uh, Leviticus 13 gives very strict uh, guidelines for if you have been diagnosed with leprosy, an infectious skin disease, you're to go live out, outside with the other lepers until you are made well, until you are healed from this infectious disease. I'm not a doctor, I don't pretend to be, but I've got common sense enough to know that if you have an infectious disease and you go live with other people with an infectious disease, you might be there for a while waiting for that infectious disease to leave, right? <laughs> if you had leprosy, according to the law, if you have to be around people, you must announce yourself as unclean. Imagine walking through the market. Imagine going through the grocery store, and if someone starts coming near to you, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. That's a terrible reality to, to live with. That's a terrible uh, task to be hanging over your head. I'll take it a step further. In that age, in that time, it was believed that if you had a sickness like this, it was because of God's judgment for sin. Do you remember when the disciples came up to, to a, a man lame from his birth and they said, Lord, whose sin made him like this, his or his father's? Where'd they get that from? That was the common belief of the time. As you're, if you're a leper walking around town, declaring yourself unclean, everyone will hear that and, and assume he must have sinned really bad for God to put that on him and, and punish him with that. Here this leper comes before Jesus and he bows down before him, kneels before him, and he says a, a prayer that many people have prayed, if it be your will, you can make me clean. He did not come to Jesus questioning his ability to. He came to Jesus questioning his will, questioning his desire to. What chapter of Mark are we in again? Seven. Chapter 1. It's early in Jesus' ministry. How do I know this? It's the first chapter. <laughs> so here this, this leper who doesn't know Jesus very well yet, who does not have the New Testament revealed to him, comes and kneels down before Jesus and says, I don't really know what your will is, but if you want to, you can make me clean. I want to read this also in, in the Passion Translation, just so we can get the, the weight of Jesus' answer to him. A little bit different translation. Uh, on one occasion, a leper came and threw himself down in front of Jesus, pleading for his healing, saying, You have the power to heal me right now, if only you really want to. Being deeply moved with tender compassion, Jesus reached out and touched the skin of the leper and told him, Of course I want you to be healed. So, so now be cleansed. Instantly, the leprous sores completely disappeared and his skin became smooth. If you have NIV, the word used here was Jesus became indignant. The Greek word that describes Jesus' emotion in this response, it could just have easily been translated to anger because this Greek word is often sometimes translated to anger. Not appropriate here, I don't think. So, you know, we, we, we didn't get that wrong. But the powerful response that Jesus gave him, he says, I will be cleansed. How can we know the will of God? Have you ever thought about this before? This is a whole different, <laughs> a whole different sermon here. Are we supposed to know the will of God? Can we know the will of God? Can we know all the will of God in our lives? I want to do a Bible drill here. Uh, from the, the teaching of Paul, turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We've got to go quick. Chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by the testing, I'm sorry, that by testing, 
you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Still Paul, speaking to, to a, a different church now, he says in verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. Making known to us the mystery of his will. Ephesians chapter 5, verse, um, <laughs> verse 17, 517. Paul writes, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Turn a few pages to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul writes, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let me ask the same question again. Do we know God's will? Are we supposed to? According to what Paul writes to the church, it sounds to me like we're supposed to know the will of God. <laughs> now, do I know all of the will of God? I hope you never think that. <laughs> that, that, I, that I would know what God's will is for every part of your life. There, there are some things that, that are a mystery to us and, and some things that I would never be arrogant enough to say, I know all of the will of God. No, but he has revealed to us his will through his word, through the revealed word of God, he has revealed his will. Amen? Amen? So I do not allow myself any longer to say, I don't know what God's will is. I don't know what God wants for my life. I don't know what God wants when, if, if I meet someone who, who hasn't met him before. Well, I don't know what God wants. Of course I know what God wants. He told us in his word. I may not know all the details. When we pray a prayer like, God, if it's your will, we're declaring that we don't know his will, that we're ignorant of, of his will. The leper came up to him early in Jesus' ministry without the written word of God in front of him and said, if it's your will to heal me. Jesus confirmed to him, it is my will. Is it in every situation? I don't believe the Lord was teasing us when he told us through the Lord's prayer to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wasn't teasing us and he wasn't giving us an impossible thing to pray. It takes responsibility to pray something like that. It takes responsibility to rise up and have faith. Think about this. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it'll cast itself into the sea. the size of a mustard seed. That's a speck. Amen? Have, have you ever seen a mustard seed before? It's, it's supposed to be, if, if you drop a pencil on a piece of paper, that speck is supposed to be approximately the size of a mustard seed. That much, and you can say to a mountain, be moved. Did God put mountains in the wrong places? No. Does he need us to rearrange the landscape? I don't, I don't think so. Um, what he's saying here is if you have a speck of faith, you'll be able to pray impossible things, what everyone says is impossible, and see it come to pass. When Jesus was walking on the water after the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples looked out from the boat and they saw him coming across the waves, and they, they said, it's a ghost. Jesus said, I'm, I'm not a ghost, it's me. Uh, Peter says, well, if it's you, tell me to come out onto the water with you. Testing him. Jesus said, come. Well, I, I guess here we go. <laughs> Peter gets out of the boat 
and he starts walking on the water. How was Peter able to do that? It was through faith. He heard the word of God. He heard what Jesus said to him, come out on the water. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Peter heard the word of the Lord, come out onto the water, and he started walking on water. A speck of faith allowing him to do something that was impossible. Can we walk on water? If, if you grew up in church like me, every trip to the pool you tried it. Every, every time you tried it. And every time you went kasploosh, right? <laughs> Jesus was superseding the laws of nature. Supernatural. Superseding the laws of nature. Peter got out of the boat and started walking with him. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, these works I do, even greater will you do. But he hadn't even said that yet. He said that at the Last Supper. Peter, during midway through the ministry of Jesus, on his word, gets out of the boat and starts walking until he sees the strength of the wind and the waves, and he takes his, his eyes off of Jesus and he starts sinking. Jesus comes and rescues him because we serve a, a good master. Amen. A gracious master. Doesn't let him drown, brings him, brings him back to the boat, and he says to him, you of little faith, why did you fail? Excuse me, sir. I just walked on water. <laughs> and you're now calling me little faith. It was little faith. It was the faith the side of a mustard seed. And that was enough. That was enough to get him to come out of the boat. That was enough to get him to, to come walking across the waves. Don't tell me you, you don't have enough faith. You only need a speck. Amen? God has given you a measure of faith. He has given it to you. But you've got to be responsible for your faith. There are many people who teach that it's God's will for healing. And to reconcile the fact that not everyone's healed, they'll say they didn't have faith. And the scenario that we always hear is the person who's on their deathbed and a minister or, or whomever it may be stands over them and says, it's God's will for you to be healed. You just don't have faith, so I'm sorry. That's despicable. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's terrible. I would no sooner say that to someone on their deathbed than I would looking at them and say, it's not God's will for you to be healed. I, I guess you're going to die. Remember Mark chapter 5. When Jesus is going through the crowd and they're pressing all around him and the woman with the issue of blood comes up behind him and grabs the hem of his robe, and she's healed. She was saying in her heart, if I can just reach him, I'll be made well. And she was. And what did Jesus do? Who touched me? He didn't even know she was coming for him. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. From there, he goes to Jairus' house where his dead or sleeping daughter is lying on her bed. People are mourning for her because she has just died. And Jesus comes in and he takes her by the hand and says, little girl, arise. Now, let me ask you, did Jairus' daughter's faith heal her? No, it did not. She was dead. She couldn't have faith for herself to be healed. But Jesus stepped in and pulled her up out of the bed anyway. Jesus had faith. Her parents with her had faith. If you say to that person who's on their deathbed, I'm sorry, you don't have enough faith. What is your faith doing? I know there are pushbacks to this. I know there are, are many, 
this is such a, a big subject, it can't be covered in, in one week. There are arguments saying that if, if you uh, preach this way, if you tell people that it's God's will for them to be healed, and they're not, then they will walk away from the faith entirely. They'll walk away from Jesus entirely. I hope no one has um, made a condition upon them following Jesus that, that uh, they have to see everything that they want or else they won't follow anymore. I've, honestly, I've never seen that in real life. I never have. I like to think of this mentality as the same as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before the king saying, God, uh, saying oh king, we know that our God will save us from you, but even if he doesn't, we're not changing course. Even if I don't see it come to pass, I'm not going to mold what I read in the word of God to shape an experience that I have had. Mm. Another counter argument is, oh, let's see. <laughs> Another counter argument is, is that some, sometimes God, God puts sickness on people to teach them a lesson. Sickness doesn't come from God. And if you're waiting to learn something from your sickness, start learning quickly. <laughs> many people who, who say this have been sick for many years and not learned. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, please. I know that when, when we pass from this life into the next, every tear will be wiped away. We will know entirely. Paul said that, that right now I, I look into a, a mirror dimly. Now I know in part, then I will know it full, fully even as I am fully known. We don't know everything on, on this side of it. And also, we know that when we are there, we will be fully made whole. But can I tell you today, I am not waiting to die to be healed. If I'm waiting to die to be healed, am I saying that Jesus is my healer, or death is. Isaiah chapter 53. This is what the prophet says. Verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Hallelujah. King James, good old King James says, by his stripes, we are healed. Referring to the whip upon his back, striking him 39 times, leaving such a, a, a open wound on his back. In Psalm said, I, I can count all of my bones. David said this in Psalms. Jesus' back was so exposed, you could see his rib cage. You could count all of his bones. It wasn't just wounds. The word is wound, singular, because it was so large. Jesus has done this. Jesus has, has made atonement for you, and he has made the, the bread of his body was broken for you to be healed. Healing is part of redemption. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. You may say this is, this is just talking about emotional healing. Emotional healing is part of it. We need it. <laughs> Here's what Matthew records. Chapter 8, verse 16, he says, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirit with a word and healed all who were sick. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Keep your, keep your finger right there. Turn back to uh, Isaiah 53 
What does it say he took? He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Coming from uh, uh, being translated Hebrew to English, Matthew, we're translating from Greek to English. He says, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Jesus has done it. Here's, here's the New Testament's account of Isaiah 53, 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 and, and I'm sorry, chapter 2 and, and verse 22. Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on, the, on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Somebody say, have been healed healed. This is past tense. According to Peter. Because it's not something that I do. It's not something that I earn. It's not something I deserve. Surely not. But it's something that he has done. It's something that he has <coughs> provided for his people. The same Jesus that, that bled and was pierced for our transgressions and atoned for our sin, all sin, he took stripes on his back for our healing as well. He is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. We opened with Psalm 103, David said, who forgives all of my sins and heals all my diseases. Let's pray this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you that you are good. I thank you, Jesus, that you are sufficient for us, Lord. There is nothing, Lord Jesus, that I could ever run across, Lord, that you aren't prepared for, that you're taken by surprise over. Thank you, Jesus, that we see healing in your word. Your Psalm said you sent forth your word to heal them. Everyone who looked at the, the bronze serpent raised up in the desert, a representation of Christ, they were healed. Everyone who looked at the serpent was healed. In your word, it says that as that generation traveled through the desert, there was not one sick or feeble among them. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. God, I, I pray that this message today would not be a, a message of division, would not be a, a message of uh, condemnation or, or any such thing, but would be a message to build faith, build faith in your, in, in, amongst your people, Lord God, that it is your will to heal, that you are still doing this today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for touching each and every one of us. Hallelujah. I mentioned before the the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Before they were thrown into the fiery furnace, they said to the king, we believe God is going to save us. Even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to you. This is my approach to healing. Sometimes, always, never, right? When I pray for you, and I pray for all of you, I do not pray, if it's your will, heal them. That absolves me of any responsibility to keep praying for you. God, it's in your hands, whatever you want to do, amen. I pray as though it is absolutely God's will to heal you. If I'm sick and you're praying for me, I hope you pray the same thing for me. If I don't see it happen, I start praying for the next person 
it is absolutely God's will for them to be healed. It would be foolish to say there's, there's no element of, of faith involved in praying for someone to be healed. Jesus told the disciples before he left the earth on, on the Mount of Olives, he, he said, these signs will follow them that believe. Gives a list of five things. The, the fifth thing is they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He didn't say these signs will follow pastors. These signs will follow the fivefold ministry. These signs will follow deacons, elders, whoever. These signs will follow them that believe. There's a measure of faith involved. If you are here today and you have an, an issue in your body or in your mind, in your emotions, whatever it may be, but I know that this is the message that God has given for us today. I know it. I, I, I tried to preach something else today, and it wasn't allowed. <laughs> if there's something that you want prayed for, there's something that you want us to agree in faith for you, specifically healing, but I'll, I'll pray for anything right now. <laughs> I want you to come forward and we'll pray for you. If you, if you need us to keep social distance from you, we'll, we'll pray for you from a distance. But if, if you are saying today, I, I want, I need the Lord's healing touch on my body, or I know someone who's sick and at home who needs God's healing touch on their body, I want to, to pray for you and, and minister to you in this way today. Hallelujah.